And as we get started, um, I'll turn it over to our team to just read our standard uh, lawyer disclaimer for the beginning. So take it away, team. I will just simply, yes. oh, there we go. Okay, great, great, great. Yeah, just read it. Read it. Start so it that. Started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie. And um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us for this presentation today. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be, uh, will be sending send it to uh, all the an email to all the attendees. This webinar is provided as an educational services by Alcorn Immigration Law. Um, this information discussed in in an overview only and should not be considered as a legal advice or advice to take um, any specific action. So please be sure to consult a knowledgeable professional with um, assistant with your particular issue. And it's my pleasure uh, to introduce you to our CEO and founder, Sophie Alcorn, and our expert individual immigration attendee, uh, Nadia Zaidi. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, fabulous. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, as Dua just mentioned, you're all going to get the recording. Um, and if you want to ask questions, please do so throughout. I can talk about immigration law for days, for hours, or for minutes. Um, so normally these webinars are chock full of Lots and lots and lots of information. Um, and just thank you so much. And we'll try to manage the Q&A panel throughout. So today's webinar. So I'm Sophie Alcorn. I'm the founder of Alcorn Immigration Law. I write for TechCrunch. I am the Sophie behind the Dear Sophie uh, immigration column. So if you ever have immigration questions, you can always reach out. That is what we do here. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on DIY green cards. Can you self-petition? So DIY, and we have a lot of people from all over the world, which is super duper duper exciting because, um, I, well, it's amazing to feel so, you know, connected to people who are on so many continents and in so many countries and in so many time zones. And I'm glad that this morning time works. I'm in Palo Alto, California, um, where our office is based in Mountain View. I just moved to Palo Alto, so I'm in Palo Alto now. Um, but I always have this sense that I'm part of this, you know, global community of inspiring, uh, that, that I feel so honored to be part of this global community of creators who inspire me. Um, and so this webinar is really for you. Uh, to talk about how you can get your freedom in the United States through getting a green card. Uh, how do you get a green card without some sort of 90 day fiance situation or even, you know, waiting around for an employer to do perm and sponsor you? And I have a lot, a lot, a lot of information, but essentially we're going to talk about it doesn't matter if you're inside the US already. It doesn't matter if you're outside the United States. There are a lot of ways to navigate this process. And I hope to give you lots and lots of information today on all of those options. Okay, so by way of background, if you are new to the Alcorn Immigration Law Fold, uh, I'm Sophie Alcorn. I'm a certified specialist in immigration and nationality law by the State Bar of California Board of Legal Specialization. I'm required to say that whole thing when I say that I'm a specialist. Um, founder of Alcorn Immigration Law, and we help startup founders and startups handle and navigate all of their U.S. immigration. So for creators and rapidly scaling teams, we do U.S. visas and green cards. And the mission of Alcorn Immigration Law is to overcome borders, expand opportunity, and connect the world by practicing compassionate, visionary, and rigorous immigration law in service of the betterment of humanity. So uh, what we wanna do is accomplish together. And that really includes, um, I remember being a little girl and my dad was an immigration lawyer and he went to some immigration lawyer conference and brought me back a shirt from probably New York or Washington DC and had all the flags on it. And it said, uh, citizen of the world. And I really, really identified with that. Um, 
And so I just imagine a world in which any child can grow up knowing that they have the opportunity, the safety, the security, the freedom to live their dreams and create and accomplish and create co-create new opportunities in the world that can, you know, make new technologies, make art, uh, create new companies that create jobs for people. Uh, there's the possibility of so much abundance. And um, sometimes I uh, think about like traditional Chinese medicine, like you want the chi to flow and that's what acupuncture is about or, uh, and now I'm going to get weird and spiritual, but like chakras, right? So um, it's like U.S. immigration law is this like constricting force on the free flow of energy and creativity throughout the world. So hopefully this webinar today can give you the information you need to be able to flow more freely to wherever you need to go. Uh, we're part of this vast Silicon Valley network. So if you want to become our client, we're happy to support you, whether that's with fundraising for your startup or getting um, news coverage. I was just in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago, um, was interviewed by the LA Times. So, so we have these connections to people who care about immigration law and immigrants and creators and startups. And we're you know super excited to uh, leverage our network to support our clients to better create in the world. Okay, so some of the reasons you might be here. Do you need a faster green card option? Uh, because maybe you were born in India and China and you're super annoyed by our racist immigration law system that punishes you based on the country of your birth. And you could, you know, already have a PhD and be stuck in some insanely long backlog. Uh, before the pandemic, the Cato Institute estimated that if you were um, brilliant enough to have a PhD and had the luck of the draw of being born in India and you wanted a green card in the United States, that EB2 category would have a wait list of over 151 years for your turn in line to get a green card. So uh, these green card backlogs really affect people subject to the India and China countries of chargeability for purposes of the visa bulletin from the State Department. So we're going to be talking a lot about that. How do you fast track yourself into EB1A, which also has the lovely benefit of you can self-petition. You do not need a company to sponsor you. So on that note, another reason you might be here today is if you need to break away from your company to have freedom. And yes, we represent a lot of companies. I'm very excited about the amazing um, contributions that uh, companies do for their valued team members and supporting them through the U.S. immigration process. Uh, but sometimes you might have different dreams. You might need to follow your heart. It might be time to uh, leave that fang company and create your own startup finally. Um, or you just don't feel that, um, you know, a tech company is as reliable as it was even a few months ago to sponsor your green card. Um, and then, you know, another reason uh, you might be attracted to this webinar is if you want to be a startup founder. We work with lots and lots of startup founders from around the world, whether they're already inside the United States or even if you're like in a basement in Iran and you're, you know, coding your Web3 app in the middle of the night. Um, and you've never been to the United States and you've never gotten a visa and you don't have ESTA or a B1, B2 and you weren't an international student in the United States, it's okay. Uh, we can help you whether you're inside the US or outside of the United States. Um, if you're from Norway and Sweden and you want a unicorn but you don't wanna be a US tax resident, we can help you avoid getting a green card but have the freedom to come here. And if you're from you know, Venezuela or a country going through strife or challenges, um, you know, we can help you have that freedom and security for yourself and your family and your spouse and your team and your kids and whoever else, your parents one day um, to be able to have a safe life where you have the, um, you know, peacefulness, prosperity and freedom to be able to be truly a creator. <clears throat> oh, okay, I get really emotional about this uh, because I see the effect of, of what we're able to do and the effect that green cards have on people's lives. And I see how um, trying to follow the convoluted, complicated, 
and antiquated Byzantine immigration laws of the United States really dampens people's creativity and even you know traumatizes people. Um, a lot of my clients have even have uh, PTSD symptoms from trying to you know legally navigate the U.S. immigration process. Definitely can crimp your style when you're trying to invent something if you're um, needing to constantly worry about maintaining your immigration status or what to do in case of a layoff when you may have a 60 day uh, window to leave the country. Which, by the way, if you're following that, um, I did get, I did uh, successfully work with, um, welcome, Nadia. I, I was able to successfully uh, ask Congresswoman Lofgren and Eshu to send a letter to the Department of Homeland Security requesting that the 60 day grace period be increased to 120 days for tech workers right now. So that's happening, hopefully. And I got word from a White House advisor that that's, you know, on the radar potentially. So that will be hopefully, fingers crossed, everybody say a prayer that that will happen. Amazing. So, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, this is Nadia Zaidi. She's our illustrious business immigration attorney focused on extraordinary ability and national interest waiver cases. She leads our practice group doing O1As, EB1As, and EB2 NIWs. Welcome, Nadia. Thank you, Sophie. I apologize for being a little tardy. I got sidetracked with the client issue, but I'm happy to be here now. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for putting our clients first. Okay. So this webinar is really designed for people who are in tech, people who want to be startup founders, people who are international students, um, potentially already, you know, in the U.S. on F1 with CPT, OPT, pre-completion OPT, post-completion OPT, STEM OPT, any type of OPT, um, and also individuals and families if you're looking to move to the United States. Some of our clients say, hey, look, we've got teenagers. Uh, our life is pretty okay, but we want them to go to college in the United States. How do we get in-state tuition? Okay, we want those green cards when our kids are teenagers, but we don't want to just transplant them on an H-1B, so let us get the green card first, and then we'll move our family, and then we don't have to worry about our kids aging out when they turn 21. So lots of reasons might have brought you today, but let's dive into it. Okay, so for tech workers, um, we've been seeing the layoffs, right? So government printed a bunch of money, now the Fed's worried about curbing inflation, so they're raising interest rates, so talent isn't free anymore, so all of the big tech companies have to change their hiring strategy. We're seeing a lot of early stage uh, venture-backed startups that got the memo from their, their VCs back in spring to conserve capital. Like They have runway and they're hiring right now, but there's you know still been several layoffs in the tech sector. Um, but we're going to be talking about options if you have uh, professional accomplishments, maybe an advanced degree like a master's of um, engineering or an MBA. Um, this is also particularly important for people stuck in H-1B forever if you're from India or China um, as you're waiting for your priority date to become current. For international students, some of the things you want to be thinking about are um, when will I be graduating or did you already graduate because you're going to be on a, a timeline your job search ties into this. Um, you can actually potentially self-petition a green card before you graduate, before you get a job. Um, but then we want to make sure that you do not have to immediately travel outside of the United States. Um, in COVID, that was kind of okay because it was impossible. Now people are like, well, there's that wedding or, oh, my friends are going to Mexico. Um, so one of the things you want to think about is whenever you're ready to embark on this um, green card process through self-petitioning, you want to make sure that you're um, talking to your immigration attorney, such as Nadia, about uh, what are my travel plans? Do I um, have a dual intent visa that allows me to travel in and out? Do I need to stay planted in the United States for some time? How long will it take? Um, those are some of the considerations that you'll have along that way. And uh, one of the really cool things for aspiring startup founders is uh, we can actually um, structure, so, so there's a visa, the O-1, that's kind of like a stepping stone, uh, an EB-1A light, and we'll get into all of these requirements, but um, sometimes like you just need to make money from a lot of different sources. You could have your startup, but then somebody else wants to pay you hourly to be a consultant, and then some 
um, thought leadership thing wants to pay you as a 1099 contractor to give a speech and then your friends uh, from the incubator are like, hey, I want you to be an advisor. I'm going to give you, you know, half a percentage or something of equity. And then a venture scout or, you know, the, the VC is like, hey, will you be a venture scout? So there's all these opportunities. And with a traditional H-1B or a TN, you're like, oh my God, I can only do one thing for that employer. So all, all of this can also help you have um, multiple income streams, which is pretty exciting. And we can do that before the work permit stage of the I-485 through an O-1, which can be a great precursor to the EB-1A or the eb 2 aw And um, we kind of talked about this, but a lot of our, a lot of our clients too, um, it's like, Two brilliant people got married. One of them got a work visa. The other one can't work. Uh, you're like missing a large income stream opportunity if you could have a uh, two-person working couple. So this is all uh, on the path to having that get set up as well. Um, so let's dive into the immigration context. And I see that there's a lot of questions coming in. So this is fabulous. So please keep them coming and we will do our best to monitor throughout. Um, but Nadia, could you please tell us about the typical path of, uh, do you have to have a visa to get a green card and when can you get citizenship? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So typically you, I'll work with examples. You might come to the U.S. as a student and then that's a visa. It's an F1 student visa. You do your OPT, you get either a job offer or you start your own venture and then you figure out what is the best employment authorization you can get after your time as a student and after all your OPT time is up. And so you might jump from the F1 to another visa. So that could be an O1 if you've already made extraordinary, um, if you meet the extraordinary ability criteria, it could be an H1B if you get a job offer from a startup or maybe it's even your own startup sponsors you for a different visa. And at the same time in parallel, you can see if there's a green card pathway that's also possible for you. So what I like to tell people is the way you can think about it is there's two roads and you're on your visa road and then the green card can be going in parallel. So so both things can be going in parallel. It doesn't have to be you get one and then you jump to the other. But the reason you want some sort of employment authorization even before you start the green card process or at the same time is because there can be some time before the green card pathway provides you with employment authorization. So you need sort of a bridge uh, between those two things happening. And then once you do successfully get your green card and your green card holder for five years, you can apply for citizenship. Um, so that's typically how the path looks for many people that we work with. Yeah, and a lot of people are like, okay, well, the only thing I can do for myself is apply for citizenship one day and I need a school to get me a visa and I need a spouse or a company to get me a green card, but that's really not the case. We can set things up so that you can get a visa through an agent for an 01 and then you can self-petition your green card and then you can apply for citizenship when you're ready. So you can really do it yourself uh, the whole way. Um, okay. And then Nadia, just a little bit about students, please, and their typical immigration journey. Yes, yeah, so students come in on an F-1 visa and they should be enrolled in school full time, taking all their courses, finishing the requirements for their degree, and then they are offered OPT or optional practical training. And the whole purpose of that is training in their field related to their major. And you have that for 12 months. And if you're a STEM major, you get an additional 24 months after that. And STEM is science, technology, engineering, math. Um, and so if you are one of those STEM majors, then you have plenty of time to get experience. But that first year of OPT, you can be self-employed. So you could technically start your startup at that point. You can start working on it. You could maybe start acquiring evidence you need for your next step, which is 12 months down the road. STEM OPT can be a little bit more complicated because you need an employer-employee relationship and you need a training plan, but it can still be done and we do do it. You just need to make sure that even if you're working for your own startup, it's structured so that you're an employee and there's somebody that has oversight over, over your position and can sign your training plan. And then after that, you can possibly go on to an H-1B, which is the famous or infamous lottery. Um, again, we do many where 
startup founders are sponsored by their own companies and put into the lottery. You just have to meet certain requirements, which we um, guide you through. And if you make it through the H-1B, then you figure out what's the next step. And it's usually green card and then eventually citizenship. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And one of the questions I noticed as I was looking at the Q&A panel uh, was... Oh, well, first of all, yes, uh, everybody is going to get a copy of this recording. So rest assured, if you registered, you will definitely get that. Um, also, as we go into this, it is possible to get any green card with never having had any visa. So mm -hmm. if you live in South Africa and you've never been to the United States and you can't get ESTA as a visitor for 90 days um, and you just want a green card, you can just get a green card. There's no requirement. You need an O-1 first. Sometimes it's helpful for our clients in the U.S. Um, who need to continually maintain stat status and hop from one thing to another and get job freedom sooner to have an O-1 first. Um, and then also uh, everything we're talking about. So although Alcorn Immigration Law does have this tech vertical focus with founders and rapidly scaling teams, um, we also help all sorts of creators, and we'll be going into this in just a minute, but you do not have to be an engineer to qualify for any of this. Um, we help entrepreneurs, we help uh, technology executives, we help artists. There's a lot of types of careers and fields. We, we help um, like YouTube influencers, so don't worry. Uh, lots and lots and lots of fields um, can qualify. Okay. Um, okay, we've sort of touched on this, so let's just keep it moving forward. <clears throat> so just to put this into context, um, as Nadia mentioned, visas are temporary, green cards are permanent residents. There are many types of green cards. So imagine a mountain with many paths up the mountain. Um, on one side, there's, uh, it's like a ski resort. We're gonna have, well, ski, you go down, I don't know, hiking trails. So in one area, there's an area for families. So that's like your 90 day fiance TV show. That's your, um, I just married a US citizen on my vacation and now I'm gonna get an immediate relative green card. That's uh, bringing mom and dad over once you have a green card. That's like, oh, I put my sister in 10 years ago and it's finally her turn in line. That's the family side. Once you get to the top of the mountain, the tops of the mountain is the same. It's a green card. It's just a green card. You're a permanent resident. You can live and work here your whole life. Another side of the mountain, that's the um, diversity visa lottery, which is a green card lottery that the State Department does for free every year. If you're from Mexico or China or India, you can't do it. But if you're from Madagascar or Ethiopia or Estonia, you might have a really good chance. It's free. Um, you don't know if you're going to get your green card, even if you get selected, but not a lot of harm in doing that. That exists for some people. So then there's this other face of the mountain that is um, the employment-based green cards. And all of these categories, EB stands for employment-based. So the two that we're really going to be focusing on today are the EB1A for extraordinary ability and the EB2 national interest waiver. And the reason that we're focusing on those is because those are the ones that our clients can self-petition where you do not need a company to sponsor you. If you have a company that wants to sponsor you for one of these, it's fine. If they're going to pay for it, if you want to work there, if they're going to sign the papers, that's great. You can do it, but you don't have to do it that way. Um, there's a variety of other types of green cards that companies routinely sponsor people for. And so if you've already learned about this, you've heard about, okay, I'm going to go through the H-1B lottery and then my company is going to do perm for me, and then we're going to wait for my priority date, and then we're going to do the I-140. So essentially with EB1A and EB2 and IW, there's no perm. So you immediately file your I-140, and your priority date, if you're from India or China, is much more likely to be current if you're in the EB1A category. Um, if you're from another part of the world, you're probably going to be current in either situation, EB1A or EB2 and IW. And so whenever you're current, that's when you can file your I-485. So there's two components. The I-140 petition says, here's why I'm special. For an EB1A, you're saying, here's why I'm special and why I've risen to the top of my field or subfield in a country or in the world. So it's a 
historical look back on what you've already accomplished. The EB2 is saying, um, I'm special because it's in America's national interest. That's the NI national interest waiver. Um, America really wants me because here's what I'm going to contribute to the United States in the future. So it's a forward looking prospective, here's my potential. So EB1A is harder, but quicker. EB2NIW is easier, but not available to everybody. So that's just like putting this into context. And then the other thing is, yeah, if you have a million dollars, um, you can totally go for EB5. They just reactivated it. They just made it easier. But a lot of our clients would rather spend a million bucks becoming famous um, and using those credentials to help become a thought leader and build their career and get a green card for much cheaper amount of money along the way and then actually be able to invest in your own endeavor. So that's like the big overview. If we delve into these categories in more detail, these are the biggies that companies are involved in. Um, the EB-1 actually has three subcomponents um, for multinational managers, outstanding researchers, and extraordinary ability. So if you're from India or China and you maybe came here on an L-1 and you're still working for your company, you could have that company put you in the multinational manager category. You don't need to get all the EB-1 um, extraordinary ability accomplishments. So just there's several types of EB-1s we're focusing on extraordinary ability today. And then... Nadia, here's the March Visa Bulletin that was just released like yesterday. Mm -hmm. So it's super new. And everybody, if you're trying to understand um, what the Visa Bulletin is, it's sort of like you go into a deli and you take a number and then you wait until they call your number. And then you get to go to the front of the line and order your food. You get your green card. But you don't necessarily know if you go in and you pull number 72 um, you kind of have to like wait to figure out like, oh, are they on number 17 or are they on number 68, right? How long am I going to have to wait? And then if number 68 has an order that takes like days, um, it actually might be really slow until you get your turn. So that's kind of how this visa bulletin process works from the State Department. Um, could you explain what a priority is, how you get it and how this chart works, please? Yes, sure. So when Sophie referred to filing your I-140, petition. And so let's say you're self-sponsoring an EB1A and you're from India. So you file your I-140 petition. You we, we ship it off to USCIS. The first thing USCIS does is they receipt the application. So they mail you and they mail us a copy of the receipt notice that says we've received this petition. And on that receipt notice is a priority date. And it's usually the date that USCIS received the I-140 petition. So if we filed a case yesterday, let's say the receipt date is February 15, 2023. So if you're from India and the priority date says February 15, 2023, but this calendar for the first employment-based category under India shows that it's 1 June, 2022. So you compare your date to this date, and this is what tells you whether or not you can go ahead and file step two or the green card adjustment of status, I-45, all those words mean the same thing, whether you can go ahead and file that. And you can't file that until your date is, your date is, how do I say it? it eight months chosen, oh, yeah. selected <laughs> on one of the charts, depending on which chart they look at that month. Exactly. So if your date was February 15, 2023, you can't file step two because your date has to be June 1st, 2022 or before. Yeah. And I'll just say it's really helpful to have an immigration lawyer interpret this for you because the State Department and USCIS have two charts that they release monthly and whichever one USCIS pays attention to from the State Department is different every month. Um, so it depends, how you interpret it depends on if you're inside the United States or outside the United States and where you want to get your green card. We see a slight backlog growing for EB1A, but that's still the fastest if you're born in India or China. And if you have a priority date in the EB1, two or three categories from a company, uh, you can apply that priority date. And then the other thing is, let's say uh, you're from India and... Um, 
you became a Canadian citizen along the way. Well, you're still going to be in the India category if you were born there. But if you're from India and you're in the United States and your spouse was born in Kenya, uh, you actually can go in your spouse's country. So if you're married to somebody from another country in the world and they have a faster category, you can use their country. That's called cross-chargeability. Okay. Um, so we've helped hundreds, if not maybe probably soon it'll be close to a thousand. I don't know. We've helped a lot of people with these um, and we'll be sharing more about um, the class we have, which is called Extraordinary Ability Bootcamp, um, along with a promo code that you can have if you want to register for that. I'm also starting a Discord community for people to support each other, to have that accountability partner um, going through the process of getting enough accomplishments to qualify. Um, and then of course we have, we offer legal services um, if you're ready to engage. And one of the other things that we can do is just evaluate as we go through these criteria now on how to establish extraordinary ability, uh, you might have questions about, well, I have some of it, but is it enough? Um, so we'll, we're always happy to take a deep dive into that with you. And we even offer a, a program called Legal Launch where we'll really go through all of your evidence and let you know, okay, yes, you actually have a strong case now, or, um, hey, look, you don't, but here's your detailed, tailored, step-by-step, -step, like go do this competition, go write in this journal article, go talk to these VCs, do, do X, Y, Z, and then you'll be able to become um, qualified. So let's just go right into it. These are the criteria for extraordinary ability. And there are 10 of them. If you want an O1 first, which is not required, the O1 has eight criteria because it doesn't focus on artists, but there are other visas, the O1B that we can get for UX UI designers or other types of artists. Um, so, so basically you're trying to get hundreds of pages of evidence to establish three of these categories so that we can make a legit argument that you're at the top of your subfield in a country. No Nobel Prize needed. So Nadia, what types of awards do you typically see um, many of our clients having to establish extraordinary ability? So there's awards that are awards in the more traditional sense of the word where you are an author and you won the Booker Prize. So that's standard award. It's it's an award that recognizes you in your field in a country. So it's professional level. Um, it's not, you, you didn't win student of the year in, in university. It's something you you were recognized for professionally in on a higher scale. Um, and in a bigger, geogra broader geographic, um, you know, area. But then for, for many of our clients, they are, they might be engineers and they're like, hey, you know, winning those types of awards isn't natural to my field as it would be for a writer or somebody who works in, in a field where you're being recognized through awards. So for people who are entrepreneurs and founders, what we found has worked well is them being selected into accelerators, which are pretty competitive and pretty selective in which founders they choose. So we have successfully argued, and of course, USCIS loves statistics and data. So we have to present what is the pool, how many founders are selected to be part of that accelerator. And it could be something, it, it could be a national government funded accelerator in a foreign country, or it could be your typical Y Combinator or one of those types of accelerators. And we've successfully argued it's a type of award, you're recognized for your excellence in the field and they choose very few people. And these are the number of people that apply every year. So if you wanna know, would this count? You should look at the selection criteria to see how picky they are and how many people they choose and what is the pool that they're choosing from. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> having a Y Combinator, Techstars, 500, um, any of those programs invest in you, um, like a Sequoia or an Andreessen Horowitz invest into you, we could use that. Um, country level accelerators. Yeah, 
Wonderful. And, and it doesn't have to be related to startups. It's just a lot of what we do. So we'll use some of those examples. Yeah. Um, okay. And as we go into memberships, I'm going to put this in the chat window. I mentioned the discord community. There's a lot of people on this webinar right now. So I'm going to share it. Um, I created this last night at 9 PM. This was my Valentine's day gift to all of you. Um, I, I am new to Discord. I hope you join it. I also need help in figuring out what a Discord community should look like. Um, so that link is in the webinar chat and please join. And uh, I, I'm really excited because there's so much interest here in today's webinar. Um, and one of the things that I think is really helpful is accountability buddies. Um, oh, and I hear the beeps happening. So I don't know how to silence that, but yeah, you're joining. Okay, great. I'm so excited. So uh, that's a way to, you know, keep in touch. Um, and if you love discord, tell me how to set it up because I don't know. Um, okay. So memberships, Nadia, what types of memberships are common? So common memberships that work well are professional level membership. Again, if you were part of a um, some sort of academic uh, fraternity or something like that, that wouldn't necessarily work. But what would work is if it's a professional level group and they reach out to you and they say, hey, you're amazing and we want you to be part of our uh, association. We want you to be part of our organization. We have, uh, or they say to you, we have or it's one where you have to apply. And they say that we get 5,000 applicants every year in this field and we only choose 30 or something like that. There has to be some sort of selection criteria. It can't be something that anyone can pay for to join. Um, for lawyers, it's easy because we have to take an exam and then be admitted into the bar. There's some sort of barrier to entry. And so if there's a barrier to entry and if it's professional level, it will help your application. Wonderful. And uh, some of the particular ones that I can recall, um, if you're like in the I, if you're like a general member of IEEE, it's not going to work. But if, if you're in IEEE and you were invited to spearhead their committee on standards for like a subfield, we could use that if you're in research or um, if it, like YC startup school probably isn't going to be enough, but if you're like in the accelerator, that can probably work. Um, so there's like levels and we need to make sure you're kind of at the upper echelons of those. Yeah. Yep. And on deck has worked as well, um, because yes. they do have a selection criteria and you have to apply. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so remember we need three out of these 10 and EB2 NIW is easier. So just follow along with us for EB1A. And then if you're like, well, I have some of it and I was born in Spain and I live in Italy, you know, you might actually have enough already. Um, so that's kind of how we think about it. Okay, so publicity, what's like the bare minimum you need if you want to go for this category and you're a researcher or you're a startup entrepreneur? Yes, yeah, so I always say it's quality over quantities. If you self-publish 100 posts on Medium, not so much. But if you um, have been published about in, and it doesn't have to be the New York Times or Forbes. I just mentioned those because everybody's heard of them. But Forbes, Inc., um, Entrepreneur, those are well-known. TechCrunch, those are well-known entrepreneurial um, media outlets where if you're written about or your company is written about or the work you're doing is written about, it's very helpful. And a USCIS officer generally does, we assume that they know nothing and that they're not going to do any additional research. So we want to make their job easy. And so when they see words like Forbes or TechCrunch, they've seen it before, they know it's legitimate and it makes it easy for them to give you credit for that. But if it's another publication that is specific to your field and say your field is data science and there is a website or journal, which all the data scientists read and you can prove that, you know, mm -hmm. you can show what their circulation is, that it's really well known in your field and you're being written about there, that could be helpful too. So again, it's context and yeah. providing that context to the officer. So it either needs to be a, a big newspaper or it has to be something that's well known in your field. So right. some of the business publications can go either way. And we actually, 
prefer, I mean, obviously the best would be like a one-on-one -on -one profile interview of you where your face is on the, you know, front of Time Magazine, but that is not at all required. Even if no. they write about your company or your invention, if we yes. can show that you created it, like we can, you know, get you the credit for it. Yeah, we have lots of brilliant people that have worked in some some technology that's in everybody's homes and they're not named anywhere for it, but they're able to draw that connection easily. So they have right. somebody that work with them that can attest to it. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if, if it's, um, you know, like the officer is like, oh yeah, I've heard of Alexa, you know, not that that was our client necessarily, but you know what I mean? If, exactly. if, if it's a consumer, consumer app and they've heard about it, um, that can, that can help for sure. But, you know, if you're like deciding which company to start, pick something that you're familiar with, don't just try to do a social app, uh, to get the green card. <laughs> okay. Now judging, um, we yeah. tell our kids don't be judgmental, but here we actually want you to officially be a judge. So what type of judge, what type of judging, what type of competitions, uh, who, who do you need to judge? Right. So this criteria is very easy for our scientists and researchers because they're asked to they're they're asked to serve on journal editorial boards and they're asked to re peer review their colleagues' articles and research. Easy. But if you're an entrepreneur and you know, we have a few people that actually have evidence for this criteria, because again, it's not something that's natural to your field. You're not you know, you're an engineer, you're not being approached every day to judge uh -huh. other engineers. But let's say that you're asked to be part of a judging panel for a startup competition yeah. where there's some really high level founders that are pitching ideas, kind of like a shark tank, but not shark yeah, tank. Yeah, yeah, a and pitch competition, a hackathon. Yeah. Probably better to not be at the university level, right? That was our conversation yeah, not a few days ago. So yeah. like the Stanford AI hackathon for chat, open AI, whatever, like for, uh, probably not great. But if it's like StartX with the alumni community, then it's professional. Exactly, exactly. And I stay away from student stuff because it actually distracts the officer. And sometimes it gets them thinking, wait a minute, is this person really established in their field? Or are they relying on stuff they did as a student? So that's why we really push for the professional level evidence. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. I just realized the time I'm having so much fun. And I told everybody at the beginning, I can talk about this for days. So let's uh, go to lightning round because there's a lot to cover and a lot of questions. So what is an original contribution? So an original contribution is something which you have either invented or worked on that goes beyond yourself and your company. So let's say you, you were part of a technology that's was maybe that was created while you were in a job or working for an employer, but that technology is now being used widely by lots of people in your field. So an easy one for this is like patents. Patents prove that you created a technology that is, is patented. It's your original idea. It is a contribution to your field because you created this technology that can be used widely by other people. Um, so that's what original contributions are. Other ways to prove original, original contributions is one of those category which we really cross-reference other evidence to prove it. So sometimes you might have written lots of articles that show your original ideas and your research and your thoughts and expertise. Like Sophie writes, you know, widely on TechCrunch, her ideas, and she, that's a contribution to her field as an immigration lawyer. And we can cross-reference all of that information she has shared with the world and say, these are her original contributions to the field. So we can cool. cross-reference stuff. It doesn't have to be just a patent or just an invention. But like being an expert salesperson and having record-breaking sales for your company is not original, whereas creating a new software to disrupt the sales process would be original. So we have to show that newness element here. Okay, okay. authorship. Um, write about stuff. If you've never written about stuff and you hate writing and you procrastinate, you can hire a ghostwriter. There are ways to get your articles published in the world. You need to edit them. You need to take responsibility for the content. You need to have them published under your name. But uh, one of our clients um, had never written anything. She was product manager. I told her to do this. 
She wrote 10 articles in a Chinese product management online journal. Uh, she got her EB1A very quickly. A couple years later, hey, how's it going? Uh, how was that whole process for you? How can we make it better for our clients? Um, oh yeah, Sophie, did you know that my articles got turned into, I got a book, I got a book deal and I wrote a book on product management in China and now it's a bestseller. So you never know, like all of this stuff is annoying to do if you're an engineer, but literally when I started Alcorn Immigration Law in my kitchen seven years ago, and I wanted to work with the world's most brilliant people and creators, I was like, oh my God, how will I prove that I'm a good enough immigration lawyer to help my ideal client? And I was like, I know I'm going to copy the EB1A checklist for my law firm marketing plan. So it's actually like a really excellent formula uh, for thought leadership and marketing success and visibility. So just do it. Um, if you're running a startup, that can be a leading or critical role, but it doesn't have to be that. You could be high up in a company. You could be running some external uh, volunteer project. Um, lots of different things where you could be leading, right, Nadia? That's exactly right. So okay. this is something, it's not industry-wide, field-wide, it's company-wide. So you could be serving in a high-level field at Google or Apple or some other company where you've, you've just made contributions in that role. Wonderful. <clears throat> and then money. Um, you can either make a high salary compared to other uh, management consultants with three years of experience in London, um, or we can show your uh, valuation of your company or even your say for other convertible notes and we, we can extrapolate a cap or um, the equity value from a funding round of your percentage in your startup. Um, there are lots of ways to show that you have been compensated a lot of money for your ideas. Um, and so any any arguments we can make on that, we are happy to. Exactly. And then if you're an artist, uh, there's other stuff you can do. We can like try to apply this to other fields, but it can be a stretch. But essentially, um, if you're making money selling tickets or uh, if your art was, you know, showcased somewhere, we've had like mobility car designers have their car design shown in car cars of the future showcases that could work in startups. So it really just depends on your field. We try to use all of these um, and, and be very creative. And then what we do when we put this all together is we help you get letters of recommendation. So in addition to website printouts, photocopies, scans, whatever of like all of these things, we need three out of the prior categories. We also help you write um, letters of recommendation. So you have very solid, comprehensive draft letters. So you can chase down that academic advisor or that VC or that person who you met at that startup conference three years ago, who's an expert in the field. And you can say, hey, Here's my EB1 or O1 or EB2 NIW letter. Please review it, edit it, make sure it speaks accurately to my accomplishments from your perspective and sign it. And then that makes the process as quick and easy um, for those people because they're always like going on sabbatical or to Antarctica or, you know, to Bezos' campfire thing in Arizona or whatever. They're always disappearing. So you really want to get them to help you. Okay, so the O1 really quickly um it can be helpful it's not required you might want it if you're already in the us if you're running out of opt if you want to be an entrepreneur before your priority date will become current or before you can file an i-485 um or if you're like in mexico city and you're like oh my god i need to get to the united states in four months a green card isn't going to do it so those are some of the reasons why people uh might want an o1 first um, we can set up an O1 so that you can have multiple gigs and multiple streams of income. It does not have to be dependent on a company. We can set you up with an agent. The State Department is granting visas again. If you're in the U.S., you can do a change of status uh, without leaving. So it's one option. Um, it has some advantages because the Biden administration wanted to support startup founders a couple years ago. So there's stuff we can do that makes it easier than an EB1A where they're counting more startup evidence specifically. Um, there's a lot of questions, I love it. Uh, here's our class, Extraordinary Ability Bootcamp. And um, our team has been sharing some of our links in the chat window. So I'll ask um, if Dua, if you could also please share the link to Extraordinary Ability Bootcamp 
as well as our promo code. This is the 15 video online course I created to go through all of the criteria for EB1A, EB2, and AW, and O1 on what each of the criteria look like. Uh, we used a variety of evidence. These are requests for evidence from the government. They have these um, detailed letters that they have sent to some of our clients in the past where they ask for more details. So, you know, we've drawn on this pool of collective wisdom of years of experience uh, to create the class. And that's how Nadia and I help advise our clients as well. And uh, so you'll be getting a promo code in the chat window as well. Okay. Um, we... Oh, okay. So just real briefly before we go into the remaining questions. Um, yes, immigration costs money, but the bigger investment is of your energy, your focus, and your commitment, because these are substantial projects that um, if you're going to undertake them, you need to be committed to. Usually the thing that gets people is imposter syndrome and procrastination. So the more, it's like why I started the Discord thing last night, we need accountability partners. And I could do some sort of coaching mastermind, but I think it's really a community, community um, need. But basically get friends or family or co-founders or people to hold you accountable. Um, as lawyers, we can do only so much. We can help you put your best foot forward in terms of legal arguments and make sure everything is organized for your documents and that you're putting your best foot forward and that you have the highest chances of approval. And we can help counsel you through, you know, travel plans and life changes as they happen. But you have to stay on top of it to actually like do the creative work in the universe and collect the evidence. Um, and believe in yourself. And so that takes friends and accountability and support. And so um, just in case some of you were wondering, um, currently I saw one of the questions somewhere, we do not have like a, a pro bono offering for this. That's why I created the class. Um, it's like less than $500. So that's 15 hours of me talking about this. If you want more of that, there's the discord community in general, these immigration processes, um, the government filing fees are between, you know, $500 and $5,000 for one person. Um, family members are additional. And then the investment in legal fees, we do everything on a flat fee basis, including responses to requests for evidence. Um, and so you're, you're probably looking at an investment between ten dollars and $15,000, for example. So just to like, keep that in mind of what financially this is, but really it's it's the time, it's the motivation, it's the accountability um, that, that really take the most for a lot of our clients. Um, because a lot of our clients are really humble. And when you're not from the United States, in, in the United States, it's like, ah, oh, make it till you make it. Everybody's a thought leader. Like, you can succeed, just tell people. Um, but that's not how most of the world works. So it, it can be a very uh, vulnerable experience to put yourself out there like this. But we try to help you as much as possible. Um, and we have many, many resources for you. So, okay, we have a lot of questions and a lot of people join Discord and this is so exciting. Um, I I will commit to staying another at least 15 minutes. Nadia, I don't know if you can do that or if you need to help a client. I do, I need to hop off. Okay, you hop off, you will be a wonderful lawyer and help our clients with your expertise and I will do my best to answer the remaining questions. Thank you so much, Nadia. Thank you, always a pleasure doing this with you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay, great. This is where I try to answer your 38 questions as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, and we tried to pack so much into that. I know we didn't go into the EB2 NIW a lot. I do just want to say about it that um, you basically, it's a lot easier. You need at least a master's degree, but even if you were a college dropout, you can still get it. Um, and the criteria for ability are way easier than for an O1 or an EB1. It's essentially like if you don't have a master's degree, then um, were you part of like generic IEEE and do you have a bachelor's degree in engineering and did somebody write a nice letter about you? It's a lot easier. Um, so definitely if you wanna find out if you qualify, uh, check out that link to our legal launch and that's where our team will review 
all of your qualifications in detail now and let you know how close or far you are. Okay. How much research and citation requirement to qualify for an EB2 NIW application? It's really not much. If you have a master's degree, you might be even able to bypass that. Um, you do not have to write anything necessarily for an EB2 NIW. You just have to show that there aren't any Americans to replace you and what you're doing is going to help America. So no, um, uh, you know, like no guns, drugs, or sex essentially uh, appeal to the puritanical virtues on this, which this country's foundation were laid. Although I suppose we could make national interest arguments for just about anything, but you can't do, um, sometimes people are researching um, like psychedelic drugs. So just keep in mind that even if something is, you know, like marijuana is legal in California, but it's illegal at the federal level, immigration is a federal process. So you're going to need some sort of licensing to do any controlled substances or anything else that's marginal. U.S. immigration policy seems like it will take decades to approve the EB3 visa. Yeah, I don't know. It really sucks. I'm trying to change the law. Maybe if you're in the Discord community, we can band together and get the senators, the Republican senators, to see the business case for why America needs a better immigration system. That is one of my life goals. Okay. Uh, but yeah, EB1A in the meantime, if you're from India. Um, what kind of references and how many of them do we need for an NIW application? Do they need to be with people we are not directly connected with and work with? In general, if you become our client, we will probably recommend that we need a total of four to six letters of recommendation from a combination of people who are both inside and outside the United States, some of whom know you well and some of whom only know you in personally. We will take a look at all of your accomplishments in all of the categories. We will figure out where your weaknesses are and we will figure out with you which experts you know that might be able to help bolster some of those art, uh, some of the evidence in the categories where you might have weaker evidence. So it's a comprehensive process that we will evaluate with you. <clears throat> I have a bachelor's degree, more than five years of experience, and I've applied for an EB3 visa. Which one will be faster to process, the EB1, EB2, or EB3? Um, I don't know. Please contact us. It depends on your specific priority date. If you have a priority date yet, it depends on which country you were born in. Maybe you were born in India. Um, it is likely that an EB1 will be faster than an EB2 or an EB3. Every few years, the EB2 and the EB3 do this dance where they go at different speeds and then the, co the companies are like, oh, we're going to shift your category. They're harder to predict, but the EB1 is the first preference. It always gets the refresher of all the available green cards every year. Okay. Hello, I am living in the U.S. for six years and currently waiting for an H-1B through my company. Last year, I didn't get selected, so I'm doing my third master's to be in the country. Bless your heart. I am wondering how to apply for a green card on my own. Also, I am getting emails from contractors that they could apply for the H-1B on behalf of me, is it trustable or is it a scam? Wonderful questions. Have your company put you in the H-1B lottery again. It's happening right now. If there's one company that's sponsoring you, they need to have a real job for you. And that company can only put you in the H-1B lottery once. If they put you in twice, your answer, your registration will be canceled. You're allowed to get multiple offers from multiple companies. So if you think it's a good faith job offer, you would consider working for that company. Uh, you're not just like, it would be illegal to just pay somebody to register you with no intention of actually, um, with them actually ever hiring you for a qualifying job. But you can have multiple companies put you in the lottery at the same time. Um, it looks like you might have a Turkish name. And if you already have two master's degrees, then I would definitely recommend that you look at filing an EB2 NIW now, including both the I-140 and the I-485, if assuming your priority date is current, um, and that will put you on the path to getting a, a work permit, an employment authorization document. Um, do you provide a pro bono attorney who can help me self-petition an EB1A green card? No, I have to make money and pay my bills and pay for my employees. Um, I am considering launching some sort of super angel um, program for equity in our startup clients. If you want more details on that, you can reach me on Discord now. Um, one day, I would love to be able to, you know, create software that can fund 
all of the world's immigration being done for free. That would be my vision. If you like that vision, please let me know how you would like that. Um, okay, now we have another question. I am an investor investing in public securities, stocks, and bonds. I was with a company, but now I'm a private investor on the H4 EAD. My H1B expired in November 22. I'm also looking to start my investment firm. What will be better for me, the EB2 NIW or the EB1A or any other option? Thank you very much. Um, you may have enough money for an EB5, but the type of company and investment you're doing probably would not qualify for an EB5. So you, that would be for a regional center option. Um, EB2 NIW or EB1A depends on your green card priority date. If you do not yet have one and you're from India, you're probably going to need to look at an EB1A. We have gotten it for VCs and investors. There are ways to bolster your accomplishments in that field, um, but you're going to have to be like a Warren Buffett thought leader type person. You can't just make really good investment decisions. You have to be kind of well known for it. Um, so hopefully that helps and best wishes to you and congratulations on starting your company. What happens if you manage to get an EB2 NIW visa, but your startup fails? Do you keep the green card and can you work for a company? Okay, it depends on the point at which your company fails. So the process kind of is file the I-140. You need to self-petition for that. We help founders structure their EB2 NIWs to work at your company or in your field. So if something goes bust with the company, you can still do other stuff related to whatever it is you know how to do. If you have a company sponsored EB2, on the other hand, um, you need to lock in that priority date by getting your I-140 approved. The next milestone is if your I-485 adjustment of status application has been pending for at least 180 days, then you're allowed to have AC1, AC21 portability to transfer your green card to a same or similar occupation at a different company. Um, so that can be helpful to preserve your green card if the company goes bust during the I-485 phase. You can also work with your work permit during that phase once you get it. If the company goes bust after your green card's approved, then you're probably going to be fine. It might come up again on your citizenship application, but if, you know, we just show everything was in good faith, it was a legit company, it went bankrupt due to external, you know, financial reasons or whatever, there's no product market fit. And look, I've still been, you know, continuing in what I said I would do in my NIW and helping America in my field. I think you should be fine. Um, so this is one of the risks that we try to help our startup founder clients mitigate in the green card process, but we, we have done it. We can help you do it. So thank you for that. Um, is there a way to go for a green card from an L1 visa? Yeah. So the L1, okay, here's the other thing. Visas and green cards have nothing to do with each other. So on this chart, you can see that the L1 visa has similar requirements to an EB1C green card. But if you're here in the US on an L1 and you want a green card, you don't have to get an EB1C green card. You could apply for an EB5, you could apply for an EB1, you could get married to a US citizen. Um, it doesn't matter. But if you have an L1, then yeah, you could probably check out the EB1A, the EB2 and IW, but also the EB1C green card for multinational managers and executives if you have been uh, if you worked for your L1 company for at least a year abroad before coming to the U.S. and your company in the U.S. has been doing business for over a year, sometimes it's almost easier to get an EB1C than an L1 renewal, actually. So you have several options. We'd be happy to help. Um, can I petition for a green card while in school as a PhD student? Yes, you can. I once had this Stanford student who worked for a stealth company and they got funding and basically he applied for three green cards at a time before he graduated. Um, that being said, it was before the pandemic. He had no international travel plans. He had just gotten his OPT and he was not from India or China. So these are some of the factors of like a student visa is for non-immigrant intent. You have to you know, promise and in good faith uh, intend to leave the country at the end of your F1 status. But as time goes on, if you change your mind, if circumstances develop further, um, you can apply for a green card when you're in the United States as a student. But if that's your status, like an H1B is dual intent, you can travel in and out while you're waiting for your green card, but not so with a student. So if you're a student 
Um, we pretty much have to make sure that you are okay staying in the US and not traveling if we're going to embark on that path. But none of these green cards require a PhD, so it doesn't matter if you've graduated or not yet with your PhD. So sometimes our clients are like, oh, okay, I want to do this. I want to start, you know, at the beginning of my final year while I'm working on my dissertation. And my plan is that I want to concurrently file because my priority date's current and I want my work permit before I graduate. And then I'm just going to go from OPT to green card and I'm never going to need an employer to put me into the H-1B lottery ever. That is a totally viable option. Uh, you said O1 with EB1 light. Can you speak specifically? Um, yeah, so it's easier. It's a similar set of requirements, but they don't judge you as harshly. So if you have less accomplishments, you'll probably, even if you're marginal for an EB1, you could, you're more likely to be able to get an O1 approved. They also have more specific recent developments for startup founders and people in the sciences and research uh, to make O1s easier that, that did not, that were not created for the EB1. Um, do you have any predictions when ROW EB2 will become current? I don't know what ROW stands for, um, but the EB2 priority date category for India and China is going to be backlogged for a long time unless the law changes. Uh, which should we choose, EB2 or EB3? I don't know. It depends. It depends on if you already have a priority date. It depends on if you're going to rely on a company to sponsor you. It depends on if you're going to do an EB2, uh, an NIW or not. So that's definitely something to figure out with an immigration attorney individually. Did you say that EB1 is much quicker to process than NIW? Yeah, there's a couple things. One is that, um, and it's changing. So thank you for helping me catch this. Um, historically, there was premium processing for EB1A I-140 petitions, but not for EB2 and IW I-140 petitions. But within the last year, they've rolled out premium processing for EB2 and IWs. So it's changed things. Um, but it's two week processing for EB1A and it's like 45 day processing for EB2 and IW. So that's one realm, it's the adjudication speed. The other way in which EB1 is quicker to process than NIW is regarding the priority date. And if you're from India or China, just those categories, um, the EB1 has faster throughput and preference than the NIW. Oh my God, you guys, 56 open questions. <laughs> okay, maybe you can put some of these into Discord. Um, I can do this for a few more minutes, but then I, I'm going to need to take a break. <laughs> um, is it possible to use a previous, say, EB2 priority date for a new EB1 application? Yes. Uh, what does C mean? It means current. So those people don't have to wait uh, for a priority date. Um, if you have an O1, do you need more evidence for an EB1? Sometimes, but not always. Often we encourage our O1 recipient clients to do a few more specific things to have a really solid EB1, like let's wait for that patent to get published or something. It just depends. Um, we'll advise you on that. Um, the priority date is June 2022. What does C mean? It means you're current and it doesn't matter what the date is. Anybody gets to apply um, would love to start working with any of you. Please contact us. Do research grants as award, count as awards for EB1A? Yes, they can. Um, there's like SBIR grants, those can count. There's different international grants. Uh, yes. Do early stage startup employees apply for this? Yes, yes, yes. You don't have to be a founder. You could be the founding engineer, um, or, or any other number of roles. Uh, we can definitely make it work. Um, would admission to Mensa help? Yeah, no, like maybe, but then you'd have to say that your field is being brilliant. Um, cause we need all of the awards and the evidence to tie to your specific subfield of extraordinary ability. So like if your IQ is 200 and you're famous for having a 200 IQ, maybe the Mensa thing would help. But if you're just really smart, but your thing is like fluid mechanics, then it's probably not relevant. Um, 
the recording of this, you'll get a link to um, like a YouTube for the email that you used to register for this. Um, membership in a professional engineering board might be counted. Uh, that's something to have us evaluate in the context of all your accomplishment. Authoring company blog, yeah, like the Google blog, like that's a big deal. So it depends on the company, depends on the readership, but we might be able to use it. Articles about you in your home country definitely count. They do not need to be US or international. Um, a pending patent is very helpful for an O1. It might be useful for an EB1. Um, a business related contribution that does not involve academic writing. I mean, just creating a company, um, finding product market fit, raising funding, getting customers, disrupting something, all that can work. Uh, approval ratings, our fees. I talked a little bit about the fees. Our approval rating is almost 100%. Um, I am ethically not allowed to make any guarantees on any outcomes or predict future percentages, but historically we've had like a 95 to 99% approval rating every year. We do hundreds of EB1As and EB2 NAWs and O1s. Um, we will often tell our clients to pause their case if we do not think it's approvable. And we're very cautious about who we accept as a client because we don't want to waste your time and money. And that's why I put all these time and resources into creating all these other things to help people because I know you don't just like come out of the oven fully, you know, ding, ready to go, right? All of this takes time. So hence the Discord group and the legal launch program and the um, extraordinary ability bootcamp class. And then we do offer service for RFE responses. They are on, we've just moved from hourly to flat fees to make it more predictable for our clients. So that's available as well. Um, God, I love all your questions. They're wonderful. This can fuel my Dear Sophie articles in TechCrunch for like a year. Um, there's too many for me to answer here. Uh, somebody's asking, nobody's offering guidance on the EB2 and IW. Why are lawyers less supportive? I don't know. I think it's a great opportunity to help people. So we do it. Um, so I'll just with that then say thank you so much. And thank you, Pepe. I really appreciate your feedback. I hope this was useful. Thank you. Oh, more than half of you stuck with me for these extra 15 minutes. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I can't wait to hang out with you in the Discord group. Um, uh, you know, eventually we'll have different different options in there for um, resources. We'll let you know about events. Um, we'll have like a community manager, uh, different different options for you know the depth of answers that we'll be able to provide in there. But really, um, I just think there's a huge opportunity for this community that I see of brilliant, creative, motivated um, people who are aspiring for more around the world uh, to come together and to support each other. So I'm very, very excited to have this community. You can definitely share your questions in there. We'll try to like answer what we can in there and give you additional resources from the blog and the podcast and TechCrunch articles and everything as relevant. And then, um, you know, let you know about our, our law firm offerings as applicable. Well, that's it. Thank you so much for uh, bearing witness to this highly caffeinated uh, webinar presentation. I look forward to keeping in touch with you. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day wherever you are in the world. Thank you, everybody. Uh, be well, do good work, and keep in touch.